Um, so after all the information about e-commerce, it was like, okay, it's maybe time for some more content optimization and some things that we could do there. Um, oh. uh, so when Pep finally confirmed it was like this atmosphere in the office, and then we did the same as a Danish would do, we probably went out for drinks like a proper Heineken, uh, and also start smoking weed because we're from Amsterdam anyway. Um, because mostly what I want you to get out of this presentation today is like some sort of a roadmap how e-commerce is completely different from like content optimization and how we as a publisher, uh, because the next app is a tech media publisher, work around our way in finding the ways to optimize what we do for content. Um, and really what I want you to get out of this is really how we try to provide context on the content that we write about and how we optimize in doing so. And I'm going to share some of the tactics and some of the information on how we try to approach this. Um, last week I was in Tel Aviv and I was there at All Things Data, a data conference around analytics and Jeff Sauer was one of the first presenters there. Um, and actually, the one of the first slides he showed was like data is dumb, and it's like the simplest slide out there, but it really somehow blew my mind. Could also have been because of the Heineken the day before, but I'm not so sure. Um, but it really tried to make me think, okay, how can you make the data smarter? And that's always what we try to think about, because in the end, we are a publisher, so we try to publish content as much as we can. We do around five to 7,000 blog posts on a yearly basis. 30 to 40 on a daily basis. Um, but how do we really try to make the data that we have on these articles more smart? Uh, and that's what I would like to talk about today in like three different areas, like analytics, how do we try to measure the information that we have on our users and on our content to provide more context? Um, how do we optimize that for from an SEO perspective? Briefly, I will touch about on this. And how do we optimize for more engagement? Because I think that's one of the biggest differences for a publisher compared to e-commerce. Um, so this is really what our funnel looks like. It's not like the traditional, you view a product page, you go to the checkout or the shopping cart and you buy the product. Um, it's completely different for us because in most cases you will start in the media side of our business. You will read our blog. Hopefully you will get engaged with us and you become a more loyal user. Um, eventually, we hope you end up at one of our events in either Amsterdam or New York. Uh, and maybe if you're based out of Amsterdam, you can visit our TQ, our newest workspaces over there. Uh, so our funnel is completely different from what it used to be as an e-commerce company. Um, and the biggest difference for us, it's not directly about the money. Like we only make a couple of cents maybe uh, if you visit the next web or a publisher, it's completely driven by native advertising mostly. And in the end, that doesn't make a lot of money, plus it's not very scalable. So we need a bigger funnel in addition to make more money out of you as a user. Um, and that's also the biggest difference, unfortunately, of the business model. Um, so what are the KPIs and metrics then for us? Because we would still like to get you in some sort of a funnel as a user. So our business metrics are mostly finding more unique users around the web that are interested in our techy, geeky, whatever content. And you guys all fit in there because you went all the way to Estonia to enjoy a CRO conference. Um, so that's the first step. And then it really drills down to becoming a more engaged user, but also a more loyal user. Um, so that's more the second step for us. And then the third one really drills down to like the micro conversions that we see out there. And it's really like trying to click a share button, share the article itself, um, sign up for the newsletter because that also will drill the, uh, move back to the second step and it will increase the returning rate of our users. Um, so the way we try to track and the way we try to do this is save a ton of information. And what it really makes it different from publishers versus e-commerce, what we see at least, is that we try to save way more on the engagement of our users. And I'm going to share in the next couple of minutes a couple of examples on how we do that. Um, so about a year ago, um, we were close to hitting 20 million hits in our GA data sets, Google Analytics data sets. Uh, and we really thought about, okay, we need to switch to a proper solution. So we found out that probably Google Analytics Premium or 360 Suite these days was the best option out there, but we really needed to find a way to normalize the data in a better way, so we created this tracking plan. It's a little bit corporate. We hate corporate stuff at the next step. We try to be as agile and lean as possible. But in some ways, when you start saving more data, it becomes very useful for us. Uh, because these days, and about a year later, we track over 450 million hits on a monthly basis with only six to seven million unique users on average monthly. Uh, so that means that on average, we save around 50 to 60 uh, hits 
per page view per user. Um, and I'm going to show you what kind of information is almost in there. Uh, to save the information, we tried to use Google Analytics and Tag Manager. We completely fell in love with this. Um, and we tried to save uh, more information in the data layer. I'm not going to tell much more about this because I think the next presentation is more going to touch about this. Um, 57 custom dimensions at the moment. Um, because we try to save as much information as possible. Actually, this information isn't even counted as a hidden GA because it's just information that is gathered towards an event or towards a page view. But we would like to lo know a lot of context about the user. If he's using an ad blocker, if he's in a certain uh, A-B test, if he's a certain returning visitor or non-returning or whatever, we try to save that in our custom dimensions. But also to try to provide more context on the actual page view. Uh, if you read a blog post about Mark Zuckerberg uh, doing an acquisition around Facebook and Sheryl Sandberg was also involved, that already means there are three entities involved there. It's Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg, and probably also Facebook, and maybe even Instagram and the other companies that are involved around there. Uh, and that's all the information we tried to save in different custom dimensions, so at the end we could really analyze what information is out there and also apply it later on to CRO and what's possible. Uh, then we tried to save some information on custom metrics, how many ads are loaded on a page. A lot of this data is provided by DFP already, uh, double click for publishers like our ad network. Uh, what we would like to know more as well, like how many comments does a certain blog post get? Uh, how many words or how many words are in a certain bucket? So we tried to bucket them because otherwise you get like shitloads of data and you can't really do something with it. Um, and that is all what we try to do to provide more context and also do that to try to optimize for that later on. Um, so one of the most easy things these days is the calculated metrics feature in there. Uh, and it's really to, uh, uh, able to provide you with like non-bounces information, something that is not in the default set these days, uh, but also the customer lifetime value, just the number of conversions of the user and the total amount of value. Um, because we try to get some users to convert or sell products to and providing this as a calculated metric makes it easier for an A-B test or for something else that we're doing or optimizing for to really gather what's the uh, uplift for certain users and what's really the potential value of them when we change certain things. Um, most of our events from out of the 450 are really gathered by event tracking. We save shitloads of data in there. If you get JavaScript errors, what kind of ads are loaded for you? We do callbacks to our ad operations. Um, we track share buttons, um, we track contact forms, whatever you can name it, we probably track it. I think the biggest bucket is our scroll depth information. Um, on every 10% of the page, we send the hit to Google Analytics and we try to save as much data as possible. Um, this already accounts for around 150 to 200 million events on a monthly basis. And in addition with our ads data, uh, around what kind of ads are loaded, it's even more luckily. But also the time on page information is very important for us because as a publisher we have very low engagement usually. You come to the site and have a very high bounce rate, so you immediately drop out. And the shitty thing about GA still is that they're not very much able to do so with your basic setups. So what we try to do with measuring a better time on page is that we send uh, an event every five seconds. If you leave the web page, we send an event as well. If you go out of the browser to another tab, we save an event as well. And this makes sure that the accuracy of the time on page is way more accurate. Um, so these days it's only off by max three seconds, we guess, because the limit is around five seconds on the riveted scripts that we use for there. Uh, and all of this is what we try to build into our GA and our GTM data sets to optimize later on the context of the user as well. Um, what we're working on right now is setting up enhanced e-commerce, not from an e-commerce perspective. Some of you might have read the blog post by Simo Hava. Uh, on optimizing your content size based on some sort of a funnel still because we also like funnels in the end. And what we're looking at is combining the scroll depth data and really making that sort of a funnel. So you click the article, you click maybe a second article, but you also scroll. And you can also see them as different actions, or we see them at least as different actions as a publisher for a page view. Um, and these are like the six main areas that we try to focus on on analytics and making sure that the data that we gather is better because with six to seven million uh, uh, users on a monthly basis, we have shitloads of data that we also need to keep clean. And it's also what the tracking plan at the beginning was for. Um, 
all the information that we try to send to Goo Analytics is run through GTM and all the data that is in there, like for saving YouTube tracking, in and out of the browser, um, scroll tracking, the whole riveted script to measure the engagement on page. Um, that's a shitload of work to build, so um, we gathered all this information in a GTM container. You can find it on this GitHub link. Please use it. Uh, I'm a huge fan of what Paul mentioned yesterday, uh, be the change, so that's what we try to do here. We don't want to make any revenue out of this anyway. We're not an agency. Um, so I think hopefully this is going to support at least a little bit more in the industry, like the use of GTM and making that more available. Um, for a web analytics part, it's really about knowing our business goals, but also knowing the micro conversions that lead to something like this. Um, so that's what we try to measure, like everything that we can, and really take the shit out of it. Like we want to know every goddamn second that you are on the next app and reading a page to and whatever you're doing there. Um, and after if we analyze this data, we also like to rank for certain things, obviously. And that's not very much long tail keywords sometimes. Um, and that's also what the biggest difference is in. Uh, because the keywords that we want to rank for in the end are these company names. Um, sometimes we do rank for them for a couple of hours in a certain area. I think we ranked for Facebook for five hours in Indonesia. Brought us 50,000 users in two hours. That's quite a lot of traffic for us in such a certain small niche. Uh, and it's also something that you come to the next web for. You want to read about Facebook, you want to read about Google, and that's the most... Uh, popular companies that we tend to write about on the next web. Um, and to provide more context there, there is not that much meta information about a certain article page, right? You get the title, you have the author, you have some more information about the number of shares, but in the end there's way more information about the article. The, uh, the, uh, the example I just gave about Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg, it's all in the content, but we don't usually know about that. And it also leads back to Google, because Google's fucking dumb in the end. They have no clue uh, what the content usually is about. They try to really understand it, but we still need to help them learn what the context is about. Uh, I'm not going to go too much in depth about this. We can talk in the breaks or with beers about how we try to set up the schema.org implementations there. But this is really how Google tries to understand the context of our content. Um, and we try to optimize the shit out of this as well. Uh, our teams are completely working with some structured data geek who knows schema.org inside out. I think he has a poster above his bed and dreams about it every night. Uh, but there we try to provide as much data as we can. And the information that you see here is very obvious. Uh, but for example, the date modified uh, and the alternative headline are usually things that you don't see on the article page. So we need to provide them in like the source code in a different way. And that's what we try to do to optimize for context there to eventually make sure that Google understands what the content is about. And it also understands the context of what we do. Um, because the competition is like hell, of course. If you try to rank for Facebook, Google, whatever, you're always going to be outranked by themselves and probably by a ton of other publishers. Uh, in the end, publishing is fighting for the page use, definitely if it's breaking news or whatever, because you got 10 publishers doing exactly the same at the same time. Uh, so you need to make sure we're different from others, and that's what we try to go through lengths to make sure that we can provide the right context for our, both our users, but also for search engines and our web analytics setups. Um, and in the end, really providing the schema of the work makes it also more scalable in the end, and hopefully more fun for Google, because they're dumbasses. Um, and also, in the end, to make sure that we understand the things that we do, because the information that we send to schema is also sent in the same way normalized to Google Analytics. Um, and then eventually, we have a lot of this data, and it makes it easier to optimize for, and really try to focus on what can we do to increase the engagement. Uh, what can we really do to focus on these micro-conversions? Getting you to click on a certain button, getting you to sign up for the newsletter, or having you to come back to the next web. Because these are, in the end, the micro-goals that we tend to focus on. Um, some testing figures on what we did. Uh, about two years ago, we had uh, zero people working on CRO. I was the only marketeer back then. It was me, myself, and I running our whole marketing team. Uh, these days, we got a team of 10-plus uh, people. Um, so that also makes it, and these are mostly some numbers from 2015, because um, uh, 2016 isn't over yet, so 
uh, we're doing quite well this year. Uh, so we had a team of two and a half people working on CRO, a two full-timers supported by like one intern. But on the side, it wasn't actually two and a half, it was probably like more one and a half because they also needed to support our analytics, our ad operations, and our sales teams for some reporting. Um, and we were able to run uh, 38 million tests, uh, or sorry, 38 million sessions with tests. It's pretty cool, right? Uh, <laughs> But the funny thing was there was only 35% still of our traffic. Um, and we wanted to do way more, but at some point you also hit the resources of the team with like two and a half people. They were already completely stressed out. Maybe that's why they drink so much Heineken in the end. <laughs> we need to figure out at some point. Um, so that meant we run around five to seven tests a week. We eventually ended around just around 200. Um, the guy that was mostly focused on CRO got his hand into a, a, a lawnmower. Don't do that. So that got him out of a job for two weeks. So that's why we didn't make the 200 exactly. And we also started a little bit later in 2015. So we eventually made around 200 tests. And obviously, we had priceless amounts of fun. Because who doesn't want, uh, like to test that skill? Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about skill today. Because I talked a lot about it before at other conferences. Go talk to me if you really want to know more on how we scaled this process. Uh, because we're not like some shitty big corporate that needs like an approval process of six weeks to get it done. We're quite the opposite and we're like, fuck it, we'll do it live and we do it live. Um, it was already mentioned by Andre, and of course you need to give the, the German some credits for some things. Uh, the quote by Jeff Bezos, if you double the number of experiments, you're also going to double your inventiveness and the, fi the things that you find out that really work well for your website. Um, and what makes it really different for a publisher that also uh, leads back to one of the things I said in the beginning uh, is that it's really about efficiency for us. Uh, online dialogue guys yesterday presented about keeping the cost as low as possible for the things that you do in your testing program because otherwise your program itself is too expensive for the return. And it's the same for us because the return for us is very low. We still run on native advertising in the end. And we need to make sure that we get more money but just a couple of cents for a user, that means we need huge increases in engagement to really get some money back from the things we do. Um, so that's what we try to keep the cost as low as possible. So you just saw the 38 uh, million uh, sessions of tests that we run with our users, but that was still the 35% or 38%, I think, um, of uh, opportunity that we had. Because in the end, we would be able to run over 350 tests if we would really push it on a yearly basis. Unfortunately, we don't really have the team to support this at the moment. Also because the efficiency and cost uh, go down at some point, and we're also hitting our local maximums at some points. Um, the way we do this as well is uh, the same. Uh, we tried some tools last year when we were scaling up this process. But also because of the cost, we couldn't go with a tool like VWO or Optimizely. So that's what we're using GTM for as well. Uh, great tool. Uh, use gtmtesting.com. In the next slide, you will find a link on uh, the real script that we are using because we need a little bit less features and a little bit more compact script uh, than the agency guys are doing. Uh, and on the side, not sure if I'm allowed to say what we're using Google Optimize at the moment just for the beta, just to see how it works out and to steal some features from them that we hopefully can build ourselves. Don't tell them. Um, so GTM testing is now what we're using. Uh, you can find the script for this here. Uh, check it out, contribute to it if you really want to know more um, or just hack the shit out of it to make it work for your own implementation. Um, so I guess you would like to see some things that we tested really around these micro conversions and the things that we did there. Um, First one is about sharing. So, of course, sharing brings in more engagement because they engage with an accept, they click on some buttons, but it also brings in more traffic, obviously, because yeah, you probably have more than one or two friends on Facebook or on Twitter, so you would like to make sure that our content is shared across the web. Um, does anybody notice a difference in these two screenshots? Probably not, because the screenshots are too small. You're still hangover from yesterday, I guess. A um, little bit more now. Can you see the differences? The order of the sharing buttons. Um, so one of the bigger things for us, as we have a big audience, is that we can test uh, how certain things work on certain user segments. And it's also a big thing that we learned over the last year uh, on what we can do with certain user segments. So what we did here is try to focus on moving the order buttons uh, depending on what traffic source you came from. Uh, so in this case, the user came from LinkedIn or came from Facebook, and we switched the order of the, of the sharing buttons. We put always the sharing button up front, 
of the one that was most popular and the one that you uh, came from already. Uh, and the interesting thing was that it increased clicks on the sharing buttons with 16%. Uh, the other information is there if you really care about it. Um, because also always you need to make sure that you don't fuck it up your results. Um, and some other things that we tried for engagement was really tend to focus on bringing more uh, about the rankings. Um, it's a very small change here as well that you can see there, and you will see the bigger things, what's happening there. So instead of ranking the most popular, we added just some numbers there. It's a very simple thing. This is built in uh, five minutes by uh, most of our front-end developers. Um, they just need to do some ordering. The ordering was already in there. You have the number already, so it's not that hard. 36% um, increase. Please test this for yourself. That's what we've been saying for the past two days. It worked for us. It doesn't mean it will work for you. Uh, but 36% was one of the bigger wins that we had, luckily. Um, and all the numbers were correct there as well. We double-checked them. Don't worry. Um, Related stories, this is a pretty obvious one, of course, because adding more related stories will probably always make a winning case, right? Um, so by default, we showed six related stories, and then we increased them to uh, nine. The winner was obviously the variant, because just adding more articles always works better, don't you think? That doesn't make sense in the end. Uh, so what we did here as well is we had nine articles. 27, let's see what 27 articles does. Um, 24, 21, 18, that's what we tested for a while and we found out that there is actually a certain limit because at some point the user doesn't want to scroll anymore and go down the page. Uh, I think right now it's still 9 because like the increase would slow down the page a little bit because of the size of the images as well, although they're lazy loaded. Um, so 9 for us was the optimal. Uh, for event tracking, what we talked about in the beginning in our analytics setup, uh, we track well, like what position you click on and what's the impact there. So we really knew what the magic number for us was to not slow down the page and to make it more interesting for users still to click on the related stories there. Um, oh, fancy movement. Um, and also one of the things that we learned in the last year of testing more things um, is really trying to test big, big, bigger. So out of the 200 tests that we run, uh, when we first started, we were changing the call to actions on certain buttons. Uh, an improvement of like a couple percent on the next app is not that much because it will bring you maybe 50,000 more pages on a monthly basis. That's not a lot if you have six to seven million unique users. So that doesn't really cut it for us. Uh, so we needed to test bigger. Uh, if you've noticed in the past couple of slides and screenshots of the article pages, you've noticed that we had the sidebar where also the most popular rankings were in. Uh, so we thought, okay, let's just do a very bold test and just remove the sidebar. They didn't work. Uh, we thought, okay, the hypothesis there was like, okay, you get more information on the article and you can really scroll through the article and get some information on what the content is about. You engage more with the content. The content is more easy to read because it's shorter as well. And you might click the related stories because they're, uh, depending on the article though, more probably above the fold than on average. Uh, didn't work at all. Variants, uh, the variant decreased the clicks in the sidebar. Uh, sorry, not in the sidebar, but decreased the clicks for... Uh, the related stories at the bottom of the article with 17%, 14% uh, decrease in sharing clicks, uh, and a lot of metrics completely declined after this. It was the fastest rollback I think we ever did of a test. Um, and really the focus for us is, okay, know what you're testing, focus on your user segments. It's one of the most important things for us. We can really test at scale, uh, the 38 million users, which means we can also test on certain areas of users. Uh, based on geographic, like uh, users in India, we tend to piss them off because they don't bring in any money anyway. So there is usually a good target audience for us to test very bold things on. And then we just give it a try in some other countries if it works out for them. Um, try to combine the user segments, Facebook users from India, that's still a very significant audience for us, so that would still make it that our, uh, that we can focus on tests that bring in high significance of the test itself, so your test is still valid. Um, and for us, it really meant that we needed to test big, big, bigger, uh, because that makes more sense and it had higher results, but also higher decreases for some of the tests. But we learn faster and then really try to drill down in what works. So removing the sidebar was one of the biggest things that we did. If it would have had a positive result, we probably would have eliminated some parts of the sidebar in order to find out what didn't work in the sidebar and what got them really off and what didn't work for them. Um, 
So the question has been asked like a couple of times already in the past two days, what does the future look like? We would like to track more content engagement and really try to combine the scripts. Um, so that's what we're working on right now because the scripts are not easily combined and it's just faster if we would combine it. So hopefully soon we will get an update for the GTM container which will provide this. Uh, even more schema.org from an SEO perspective, there's a ton and a ton of data on schema.org that you can optimize and mark up your content for. Uh, personalization, so we're already trying to combine like user segments there and what we try to do. Uh, that's to what I just talked about by combining like Facebook users from India and giving them still, for a significant audience at least, a certain test or a certain option for personalization because otherwise we don't really believe in what the possibilities are there. Um, and I hope you get some better ideas for on how to optimize your side from a content perspective because better tracking and better decision making and knowing more about the context and knowing more about how you can optimize for the context will provide you with better data which will hopefully make better decisions and reach your business goals faster. Um, some of the takeaways here and hopefully you get just as excited as I am about this whole subject and about the whole industry. And uh, thanks a lot.